that's why you have come here today, because that's why I've come, and that's what this house and this place is for, to gather together in the name of Jesus to worship Him who is our Lord and Savior. And so if that's your reason, then you are among family here, and if it's not, we hope you change your mind, and that's what you do before you leave. Uh, thank you for coming, and we want to make you welcome to Riverside Baptist Church. If you would join me in your uh, bulletin, we got a couple of announcements. Uh, one is a change, last minute change. Uh, there won't be the youth group meeting this afternoon. Uh, the Lanes are going to celebrate uh, Emily's birthday at the, how old is Emily now? 20, 21? 22. 22. Okay, time flies, guys. All right, Emily's turning 22, and they're doing some birthday stuff with her and uh, Autumn. Uh, that's the girl who's been coming with uh, the new couple. Uh, she's sick, so they're not here today and won't be able to come to youth group. So Amanda said, I'll just do something with Isaac at home. Um, so uh, we're not going to have youth group today at 3 because most everybody will be gone. But the uh, rest of the schedule is normal. Tuesday, 6.30, Women's Bible Study. Uh, at 7 o'clock, the deacons will meet. So ladies will be meeting in the sanctuary, I believe. Yeah, sanctuary. Uh, so ladies come to the sanctuary or come through the fellowship hall to the sanctuary and then deacons will meet at 7 in the fellowship hall. 6.30 will be prayer meeting on Wednesday. 7 is uh, on Thursday, 7 o'clock, men's Bible study. And then next Sunday being the second Sunday, we have our Brookdale service at 3.30 in the nursing home. And then 5.30 is women, uh, circle of friends. Any other, um, any event coming up? Uh, yes. You see there the shoe boxes. Sorry, the uh, shoe boxes are available for you to put together on the big table in the fellowship hall for the uh, Operation Christmas Child. Okay. A uh, reminder that next Saturday is the work day to uh, clean up the church outside right. of the church. So, so that's October eighth, next Saturday, work day to clean up the outside, and you said eight o'clock, right? Right. If you got yard tools, please bring those. It'll be a help. And uh, Amanda had one. Um, for the ladies, no offense, guys. Um, we are going to have a painting party, you know, where people follow one person painting and they kind of learn how to make one. Um, on October the 25th at 6.30. I do need you to sign up if you want to come because I need to know how many canvases to bring. And if you want to just come and hang out, that's fine. You know, if you're not feeling like artsy enough, you can just come and fellowship. Uh, I do want to point out also, you see the details there about the shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child. Uh, the shipping costs, like everything else, has gone up. So that has changed from last year and many, many previous years. It's now $10 instead of 9 uh, So do be uh, aware of that change. Any other announcements? Okay. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Holy Father God, I come before your throne of grace this morning, thanking you for the opportunity to be in your presence. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can come before you, even though we're not worthy. And we don't have to come through uh, an animal sacrifice like in the Old Testament. We don't have to come through any sort of religious ritual. You paved the way through your own shedding of blood, your blood. For us to have a living relationship with the Father through you. You've adopted us into your family. And so, Lord, I just want to say thank you. I want to praise you. We are gathered here together to worship you because of your great salvation and your wonderful love. And we pray, Lord, that though there are many distractions in the world, there are many responsibilities that we have. And, and these things aren't bad, necessarily. But we pray that you would help us to put them on hold, remove them from our mind for at least the next hour, and so we can devote ourselves to worship and praise and reading your word and, and studying it together. And I pray that as we leave here and go back to those responsibilities and, and relationships and all the things we do with our lives, our families, our work, that we would do it in a way that glorifies you, because that is why you have made us. And your great love should shine through us. And I ask the Lord that you would help us to do that. So Holy Spirit, please guide us and empower us and help us to understand. We 
We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our hymn, uh, excuse me, our hymn of praise this morning is hymn number 202. Hymn number 202, I'll hail the power of Jesus' name, and we'll sing the first, second, and last.
got her results and she does have cancer of the Don't know the prognosis or treatment or anything. We can pray for Ann Bunch.
May we have mercy. If you would join me in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3. <coughs> One verse for me today. And now, uh, remember last week, if you hear or watched it on the video, I said something to the effect of last time I thought we would be done with 2 Timothy. And then I corrected myself, oh, no way, we have one more. And then, well, we're getting ready for this week's sermon. If you see there in the outline on the back, uh, I originally had four points. The passage has four things. It tells us the Bible is uh, profitable for. And then as I was, my process is normally I get the research done. I know the points the Lord wants me to make. And what I should say about the passage in a general sense. I send that to Faye on Thursday. And then on Thursday afternoon, Friday, I work over how am I going to explain it, what are the illustrations, the applications, and those sorts of things. And I just kept building and building and building. And so I might actually get amens from you guys. I'm taking out the middle. Um, taking out the middle two points, the correcting and rebuking we're going to talk about next week. And that's what I get for saying, unless the Lord changes the plan, because he changed the plan. So we'll be in 2 Timothy again at least one more week. But uh, this passage, this one verse about what the Bible is profitable or good for, or useful for, is uh, very full, if you will. So we're reading 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. I'm reading again from the NIV because I like that God breathed. All scripture is God breathed and useful, your translation might say profitable, for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Today we'll look at the teaching primarily and also the training in righteousness. And you guys know, most of you know me if you've been here for a long time. I uh, was an academic. I've spent most of my adult life in higher education in one way or the other. Uh, 18, I went to college, graduated at 22 with a BA in English. So what do you do with a bachelor's in English? You get a master's in English because there's not much you can do with just a BA in English. So I went to NC State, I got a master's in English, and I got married to Amanda after that in uh, 2003. And I was teaching, I taught at UNC Pembroke. And I was able to teach freshman writing and some literature classes. Well, I thought that was going to be my career goal, my, my career path, I was going to be a college professor. So I needed to get a PhD to get job security, what they call tenure. And you have to have a PhD and publish and all that kind of stuff. So from 06 to 08, I was attending Baylor University. Again, teaching to pay for my tuition as I worked on my PhD. I was both a student and a teacher. And that's when I got the call into the ministry. And I realized God didn't want me to be a professor. He wanted me to be a pastor. And uh, I still taught as a way of making money for a while. And I started in 2011 my Master's of Divinity, which I'm about to finish in December. So I've been in the higher ed, and when you say to me teaching, that's what I think of. I think classroom, I think professor, I think textbooks that used to cost $80 to $100, now probably $200 because of inflation. But I don't think that's what Paul means. It teaches us, but it's not only an academic brain learning, it also trains us. And so I want to put these two together because I know even though I haven't experienced it, I know there are lots of ways of learning. You can go the academic route and learn things intellectually. You can also go the very practical route and study a trade under somebody. What they used to call um, oh, just do my, apprenticing, thank you. Yes, used to be an apprentice under somebody. Somebody would teach you how to be a carpenter, how to be an electrician, how to be a plumber, whatever the trade was, how to make the thing you were making. Okay. Uh, you guys who grew up on farms, you may have gone to school to learn things about agriculture, but you learn most of the stuff 
from your daddy or your grandpa or whatever form you work for to learn how to take care of the crops. Okay, when to plant them, when to point you, bring them in, what to do with the weather when, as it fluctuates all over the place. You learn these things from people. And so the Bible gives us both. It gives us both the, the intellectual knowledge, we should study the book and learn the book, but it also can give us training by showing us examples, showing us models. We see in the Bible all sorts of people who are good role models at times, but because they're people, they're also sinful. And we see their sin and the consequences of that. And some we see just plain bad role models. And of course, the ideal role model is Jesus Christ. And his deeds and teachings are recorded in the book. So the Bible is useful for teaching us things. It, it's not going to teach us everything. You know, the Bible isn't going to help you be a better farmer. It's not the farmer's all in that. But it will help you be a better person. And it teaches us what we need to know to be saved and to be a God follower, a godly person. Talking with Earl years ago, when I was getting to know him, starting out here about his ministry, about his mission trips to Uganda, and the reason it's so important that people are teaching the local Ugandans and other Africans who come to that seminary is they have a tendency to become what we call pluralistic. They can say, yep, yeah, Jesus is great. Jesus died, came back alive. He did miracles. That's awesome. Here he is on my shelf with these other gods. Right, Earl? It's pretty basic. Right? They have all these other tribal traditions, uh, spiritualism, mysticism, and other false pagan gods that have been in their culture for so long. And one of the major things he keeps bringing his students back to, and all of them do, is where is it in the Bible? You think we should do this? Where is it in the book? You think this is true? Okay. Does the Bible say that? And he's teaching them, along with what's in the Bible, that the Bible has to be their highest authority over customs, traditions, the way they've always done it, because the way they've always done it includes these pagan things. The problem is, that's not just a way over there in the depths of Africa problem. That's not a, an issue related only to people who have come to Jesus as a first generation believer. Churches all over the West have lowered the Bible, not that they would say this, but they lowered the Bible and elevated it up other things to be competing guidelines. Competing guidelines for how we should live, who we should be, and what the church is all about. But like we talked about last week, if we believe the Word of God is God-breathed, He inspired it and directed this writing, then the only thing that has authority equal to thus saith the Lord is the scripture. And yet we've raised up so many things to compete with scripture or blended them in with scripture. And I've given you examples before from uh, family fathers like Benjamin Franklin. Yeah. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Y'all might think that's in here. Some of you might add that that's in here. <laughs> yeah. God helps those who help themselves. That's actually an ancient Greek one. But Ben Franklin made it famous in English. New examples. Where do churches get their dress code? Now, we're pretty relaxed about that here at Riverside, but some, some churches have a dress code. And if you are not dressed nice enough, they don't want you there. I had a friend back home, my former church before this one at Bethel. And he told me, he went to a, I don't know what kind of church it was, and I probably shouldn't say anyway, but he went to another church for a while. He first got back right with the Lord, and his suit wasn't nice enough, and his tithe wasn't big enough. They asked him to find another church. Where is that in Scripture?
Why do we have worship at 11 o'clock? Why do almost every Southern Baptist church in America, most churches in America, have church, church service at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning? Now, I know why Sundays. The, the Christians in the first century, especially the Jewish ones, when they were kicked out of the synagogues, they decided that instead of worshiping on Sabbath, which is the last day of the week, we're going to start worshiping on the first day of the week because that's when Jesus came back to life from the dead. We're getting in these Gentiles, our Jewish neighbors won't let us come and worship with them anymore, so they set aside the first day of the week to worship, to honor Jesus, because he came back to life from the first day of the week. And some of you already look uncomfortable, like, preacher, are you trying to tell us not to come at 11 o'clock? No, I'm fine with 11 o'clock, I don't want to get up earlier if I don't have to. But why were you so uncomfortable? Why did that make you squirm a little bit? What would happen if we decided we being some of us in leadership here, we do need some more time because the preacher keeps going over and i got to get lunch at 12. So we're going to start at 1045. Sunday school from 930 to 1030, preaching 1045 to noon. Why would that make y'all feel so bad? It's not in here. There's, I've looked. There's nothing about 11 a.m. in here. Or even the eighth hour. It's our custom. It's our habit. It's we've been doing this forever. And there's nothing wrong with meeting at 11 a.m. It's just an example. I am not planning to change it. But my point is we have so many things that are ingrained in us because we've always done them that way. That's how all the other churches do it. And if we were kids, what would our parents say? I want to do this because everybody else in the neighborhood is doing it. My parents would say, well, they jumped off a bridge. You jump off the bridge too? And they're like, no, because I'm not stupid. And I'm afraid of heights and water. But we tell our kids don't do that, but we're, we're doing that, don't we? Do we even consider? Will we, will we be more approachable by more people if we had a different worship time? Some churches do. Some churches have like an 8 o'clock and an 11 o'clock. I went to a church. It was a big one and when I was in Raleigh. We went on Saturday nights. Because I mean, we were college kids and Sunday morning was just really early and Saturday night was much more open and available. And uh, I had some buddies who wanted to go. So I went to Saturday night worship service at Providence Baptist Church for at least a semester or two. It was good. But it's weird. Is it okay to be weird? Is it okay to be different? And is it okay to change things because the Bible says so? And the Bible doesn't say what time we should worship. So again, I'm not saying it does, but we have to change it. But if the Bible did say, and we found out in here, studying the word that a better time to fit our mission would be a different time of day, a different time of day. <coughs> Or in a different kind of building. Let's do it outside. Would you be willing to change? And a lot of churches would be like, no, we've always done it. This is how we've always done it. And tradition is good. Don't get me wrong. Tradition, most of them are good. Most of them are there for a really good reason. Most of the time, we are building upon the wisdom that has come down through the ages to us. And we should do that. My point is, when that tradition and scripture are about the same weight and why we do what we do and how we make our decisions, then it's a problem. Because scripture should be first and the last. And everything else in the middle should help us understand what scripture is going to do and understand how to do it wisely. <coughs> In Matthew 15, 1 through 9, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees and the scribes. These are the guys who were the experts in the law, the scribes. And he rebukes them because he says, You've broken the commands of God to keep the traditions of man. And what they were doing was they were saying to their parents, basically, 
you're not going to get any of my money to help you in your old age, to help you after you can't work anymore. Because remember, they didn't have 401ks and pensions and retirement plans. But what you could expect from me, because the Bible says we should take care of our elderly and our parents and honor our father and mother, I'm, I'm reneging on that. I'm giving my money after I die to the church. So I'm going to keep it and use it, and after I die, it's going to go to the church. So I can't give it to you because I want to give it to the temple. They're using legal financial loopholes to get out of taking care of their parents. And Jesus says, you're breaking the law of God to keep your own traditions and to keep your money. Because of all God says, honor your father and mother. The word of God says to take care of your family. These are principles God has put into his word. And so what we've got to do is take the scriptures and what they teach us and then look and say, what is our job? Who should we be as people of the book who follow God and his word? And once we have that answer, then we can decide, do my habits and traditions and customs, do they help me be that person? Are they helping me be that guy I need to be? Are they helping me to be that woman of God I need to be and to do what God has called me to do? Or not? But all too often, and I'm guilty of this, guys, we don't ask ourselves, do the things I want to do and I have a habit of doing and I do throughout my week, are they helping me be the person God wants me to be? Am I really fulfilling that call? I don't see my call to be a pastor. We all have a calling to be a Christ follower. He's got you where you're at to do work for his kingdom. He's got you in your neighborhood, in your family, at your workplace, in your schools to do kingdom work. Now, I'm a preacher of heaven. I get up at the same time every day. I go through the same work. I've already told you some of my weekly habit. I, I do the research and outlining of my sermon by Thursday. I send Faye the outline. I fill in the rest, flesh it out Friday, go over it Saturday and Sunday morning. That's my habit for writing a sermon. I think it's a pretty good habit. But I also have other habits. Usually by 7 o'clock, I'm done with work. I hang out with the kids, get them ready for bed, then I watch an hour or two of TV, and then I go to bed. Is that the best habit to have? I need to ask myself. I need to ask myself that. Should I do something else instead of watching TV for an hour or two, or sometimes more, because I already get into the show before going to bed? Or is that wasting my time? Is that how God wants me to use it best? We have to ask ourselves, is the way we've been doing things the best way to do the things we have to do? Which is share the gospel, grow and mature in our faith, help other people become better disciples. That's every Christian's job, according to the book. And so, do my habits, do my customs, do, do the things I want to do help me do that? Or am I putting my wants, my habits, my comfortable patterns on equal or higher level than the scripture? Because my habits aren't profitable for teaching me God's will. What I'm comfortable with and my customs, they're not profitable for helping me become a better man of God. Not unless they're holy habits that have been. That have become disciplines. If your habit is pray, it's a good habit. If your habit is reading scripture, that's a good habit. If your habit is to have a bowl of weeds every morning because that's your favorite breakfast, that's an irrelevant habit to growing more like God. But it's fine, it's just not particularly want to help you. If you're ever having a bowl of weeds and God's telling you to fast, well, your bowl of weeds is becoming an idol. Here's what it boils down to. 
at the end of our life, do we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant? From Jesus. Hope we don't hear from the other guy. But if we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant from Jesus, we have to know how to serve him. We have to know the kind of person he wants his servants to be. And he's only laid that out in the book. Some parts give us direct answers. What kind of servant of God should we be? What does that servant look like? When you read the epistles from Paul and Peter and John. You want some examples? Look at Jesus. Look at the good role models from the Old and New Testament. You want to avoid? Look at the bad role models from the Old and New Testament. Sometimes they're the same person. King David, great warrior, king, great poet, love God, man after God's own heart. Dad, do not get your fatherly advice from David. He was a horrible dad. Look at the stories of his son Absalom who rebelled against him and how he treated the other one who raped his stepsister. He was not a great dad. He did not keep charge of those children well. We want to be trained to live a righteous life we have to let ourselves and make ourselves be teachable. We have to let the book, let the Holy Spirit teach us. So we can get back into correcting and rebuking, but we want to have time for them next time. What's the old saying? Some of y'all are feeling it. Can't teach an old dog new tricks. You're like, preacher, I'm too old to learn some new fangled stuff. I'm not talking about new fangled stuff. I'm not talking about we got to be like youth pastors who are whatever hip is now. I mean, it's not hip anymore. That was a long time ago. This is old fangled stuff. It's been around for a long, long time. Let's be old fangled. Let's do what the book tells us we should be. Not what we were used to being because this was polite, this was good in the 50s or 60s, 70s, 80s, whenever, unless that corresponds with the book. I'm not saying throw out the baby with the bathwater. I had godly parents who taught me godly ways. I, I love that. And I'm blessed by that. But even then, sometimes I'm like, I mean, my dad's a preacher. This is hard to say to that. I don't think I agree with you on that. What about this and this and this? I'm not saying throw away the wisdom of our parents and grandparents. I can become more like Sidney Merchant and bless me for it. That'd be wonderful. But that's not my goal. The goal is to become more like Jesus. And so while they may help us, and parents, that's our job, as Christian parents, help our kids become more like Jesus. This is going to help me most. And while our parents will have good intentions and be right about a lot of things, they might be wrong about for you. This corrects that error. You can't say, I'm too much of an old dog to learn new tricks to God. Like, really, is that the plan? He calls us home, we get to heaven, he says, well, John, why didn't you do this? It's right here in the book. He said, well, I never learned how to do that. Well, you read it when you were 20. You died when you were 102. What did you do for the last 80 years? I didn't want to. I'm not going to fly. I'm not going to cut it with God. He's eternal. We're all really, really young dogs to him. Not too old to learn new tricks. So if you get anything else out of this, I just call it all of y'all young. Young enough to keep growing. Young enough to keep learning and maturing. One of the most important things the book teaches us is that we cannot 
please God on our own. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you've got to learn and study. If you study enough of the Bible, then you're going to please God. You don't have to be an academic to please God. Daddy always said, I'm not worried about what I don't understand out of the book. I worry about not doing what I do understand. And that's where the rub is. That's where the rubber meets the road. What do you do you know about what God wants you to be, who he wants you to be, what he wants you to do? Do that. And then you'll learn more as you continue to read, pray, and submit your life to him, study it in church and Sunday school, and on your own. That's how we do it. That's how it trains us for discipline. That trains us and equips us for doing righteousness, I should say. What that tells us is those works don't please God in the sense of making us holy. Those works don't please Him in the sense of earning our way into His family. It's a free offer of adoption. Okay, so. The most important thing is it tells us what Jesus did so we can be adopted. Take the price of our own sin onto ourselves, onto Himself. And He gave us His righteousness. So we can be right before God. That's why we want to come to the table and, and remind ourselves that we do in a few minutes. But the Bible tells us not to come to the table for the Lord's Supper without examining ourselves. It tells us not to come in an unworthy manner. Now that means that doesn't mean we are worthy of the communion. That means we've got to take it in a manner worthy of. The sacrifice it represents. Humble, but also joyful that Jesus loves us so much. Repentant of our sins and accepting his offer of forgiveness, which is also his offer of being Lord of our life. And so before we come to the table, I want to have a time of invitation. If you, right there where you are, or come down here to the altar, if you want to pray, you want to ask God for forgiveness, if you want to pray for somebody else that he knows in need, whatever you want to get right with before God before we take part of his sacrifice. Do so while everyone else sings hymn number 307, Just As I Am.
But for today, these are what we have. So uh, what we're going to do is come by up this aisle, around the front. Everybody pick up one chalice and a napkin and uh, go back down this aisle to your seat. Um, everyone who is a baptized believer is welcome to share communion with us. We have what's called open communion. So anybody who is Christian can partake of the communion with us. Uh, if you're not a believer, then please don't. The Bible actually says you can drink damnation unto yourself uh, if you're not taking this in a worthy manner. You're not actually partaking of the blood of Christ because you're not being cleansed by that blood. You're not accepted his sacrifice. So don't take the elements if you have it. That being said, uh, anybody who is a born again baptized believer, please come and partake with us. We share this as all Christians have in one form or another ever since Jesus instituted the night he was arrested. Okay. So come, grab, take back your seats, go to a play while you come up here. We'll start from the earlier seats and move down to the back door. The Bible says on the night Jesus was arrested, they were celebrating the Passover. It says in Matthew 26, 26, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. But Herb, will you bless the bread? said, take eat, this is my body. Verse 27 continues, then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them. Brother Bert, would you give thanks for the cup?
He said, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus then said, but I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Which is why he did what he did. The bread signifies his body, which was whipped, flogged, beaten, torn in many, many ways, pierced. The juice of the wine for his blood that was shed for us. There's no forgiveness of sins without shedding of blood. So he shed his blood to forgive us of our sins. In order that we might live with him in that new eternal kingdom and share all things with him. That's how much he wanted me and you and everybody else in the world to be his. That's what we remind ourselves of when we partake of this and that's what we declare that is the reason why we get to glory. And so as the scripture says, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. We will sing, Blessed Be the Tie, hymn number 387, if you don't know. 387. 